Hey everybody, BTO Pro here. Today I'm going to wire up a more uh, visual design asset to Hacks. Um, so the things we've been making in Hacks have been kind of just little one-offs and like, hey, look at this neat functionality here. Um, and you can kind of get a vision for where we're going with it, but I want to start really making it start to be like a CMS replacement type of stuff uh, where you go, oh, okay, yeah, I could build a whole site out of this stuff. Um, so the one I'm going to be using today uh, to, to go off of, it's made by uh, a friend of mine. He's working on Chuck Levera. He also works on, on the project. He's made contributions to Hacks and uh, the LRN Web Components Element Library. So he's been working on this thing called a testimonial um, for their website. So their uh, website for their organization is starting to use Hacks. Um, and so they're starting to make the little design assets to fill out the page. Um, so I told him we should rename space them. But what we're going to do today is take, take someone else's component and we're going to turn it into, you know, one of our components. Just kind of show how easy it is to repurpose these things as well. Um, so uh, I can go to a little element here. And so I'm going to go and hit the demo. And I get this neat little uh, element that he's working on. So Dude loves sharks for whatever reason. So I've got a picture of a shark. Imagine this is, you know, a client testimonial, right? And I've got first name, uh, title, position of the person, and wow, I really loved your product, right? A ton of websites have this, a lot of marketing sites. Um, also does a half decent job being responsive, right? So I can go mobile with it. It's pretty cool. So um, I saw him doing some hacks wiring with this uh, the other day at one of our, our code meetups. Um, so I'm going to take it and show you kind of what my process would be. So I, I find something, and this is a case where I go, all right, I want to refactor this in some way. We're not going to use this exact thing, right? So uh, I'm not going to fork it because ODL hyphen testimonial, uh, I'm trying to be very semantic with what our things are, as are they. Um, so in the case of the ODL website, which is short for Office Digital Learning, this is a fantastic element name. Uh, for a general purpose website testimonial, you'd be like, what the heck's a ODL testimonial? So Let's, uh, let's re repurpose that a bit. Um, so I've done this in some other videos. I have a shortcut command called LRN dev. Um, you, can, you can search on the LRN web components repo for an LRN developer repo to see what our little thin, thin layer of automation is. But so I'm gonna build a new component and then this asks me, you know, name this component. So I said it was testimonial before um, and I want it to be, you know, specific to ODL, right? So could be like site testimonial or like uh, user testimonial, something something of that nature, right? It, it's, it's a person, right? Or like a person testimonial. Um, so let's do like a person testimonial. I hate that word, testimonial. Okay, yep. All right. So this is a, a person's testimonial, you know, trying to be as semantic as possible with what this is. So our tooling runs and we get this little boilerplate element just says person testimonial. So it also comes with some baseline hacks, uh, materialize and schema built-in support. So let's go and uh, let's find that. So I've got obviously some hack stuff I'm working on. There's a Rick Roll from the other day. Um, let's find person testimonial on my file system. So if you're using LRN developer, um, you see, this is how I, we build stuff really quickly. So these are all of our elements we've made. We make a, just a few. Um, so I'm going to put this over on the side here, Move this out of the way. Okay. So let's go into person testimonial and you'll see, I get this little update demo script. Uh, a readme that just quickly says, you know, some boilerplate information about the fact that it's an element, um, and then person testimonial that it's set in place. So right out of the gate, what I'm going to do, I'm going to take uh, Chuck's element. We're going to use that as a starting point. Um, so go to ODL testimonial, and let's go back to here. And we'll see he has ODL testimonial icon and ODL testimonial. And so if I look in here for ODL testimonial icon, 
right? Because he's abstracted, but he hasn't used that icon yet. So that's cool. I'm not going to pull that in. Um, so he's still doing some work on that. Uh, you can also see he's defined, oh no, actually he has done that. Okay, so he has a specific icon. Uh, that's an icon font, if you will, that can be leveraged by iron icons. Um, and so I can go in there and see that this is just a really basic uh, SVG that at the end of the day lets him say, yeah, give me that quote. And so that's how he gets this little glyph, this little quote glyph, um, and a very specific one, right? Okay, so we can pull that across. Let's do that. Um, so I'm going to take ODL testimonial. I'm going to do this raw. I'm going to copy it so that we have our starting point here. And my name is person testimonial. I'm going to copy that so I have it. And we're going to paste all his stuff in there. Um, I use Alfred app. Uh, I never make mention of that, but I use Alfred app, uh, which has a copy and paste history that it assembles. It's like 30 bucks. This is not an advertisement for them in any way. However, it saves me tons of time. So I figured I'd mention it because um, I copy and paste things a little weird, relatively speaking. So now I'm going to go in, right? So I've kind of, you know, forked this element, so to speak. I'm going to replace all the ODL references with test with person, right? And so then I like to say what this is. Um, leaving a testimonial from a person to say your company rocks. Woo! Okay. Take out some spacing. You'll see um, he's leveraged paper card, iron image, iron icons, hacks, body behaviors, and then the person testimonial icon. So now I'm going to need to go and uh, make that icon there because it's a very specific, very specific icon there. I'm going to empty out this file, go and see what Chuck's copy of testimonial icon is, raw. And you'll see the name here is ODL, and that'll be important in a second. You'll see how we swap that out. So I'm going to copy the contents of this. Go over to my icon file, paste it in. So the reason he has icon the ODL here, and then you see it says format quote. Um, if I go to person testimonial and I search for ODL colon, this is how you can define multiple icon sets for use in iron icons. So um, there's iron icon and then iron icon set SVG. Uh, and then there's iron icons. It does get a little confusing, I'm, I'm sure. But Iron icon is, think of that as the representation of that one tag. Iron icon SVG set allows you to do stuff like this and say, hey, I am supplying another SVG set. And so I'm going to name this to um, LRN, per, like person testimonial, like something very verbose here so I don't conflict with other ones. Um, eventually, we'll probably move this into somewhere else. but. So, okay, I've got person testimonial icon. And now because of that, um, that will allow me to prefix this. And the iron icon tag is going to have a registry built up to know, oh, when I see person testimonial, that means to find this named space and then find the ID format dash quote and put this SVG gobbledygook in place of where I am. Um, so there's lots of icon libraries. Uh, Iron Icons supplies all the Google material uh, style icons. Um, I tend to stick to those, but we are branching out into a couple other ones, right? We have like a specific Elms icon, things like that. So, all right, let's clean up some spacing a little bit because I am a stickler for spaces. Uh, we can see that Chuck is implementing uh, behavior here. You can also see I need to replace this with the word person. All right, let's search for other references ODL. Okay, so he has testimonial down here. So I'm going to take that out uh, in the hacks wiring. And so uh, reading down through this, let's go from the top. Um, uh, we got to make sure we have these dependencies if this is ever to work. So normally, I would, you know, the way Chuck built this, Chuck went and said, did this process I'm about to show you. However, I have to go and do it because I kind of forked his element. So I search for paper card because he said he used paper card. And I go and I get the definition, power install, go back to terminal, 
And now I need to uh, open another terminal window because that is running a little mini server there, which is what that is implying. And we're going to go to person testimonial. I'm going to paste in Bower install save. Right, let's close that other one. Um, all right, so now that's there. It also says it got iron image. That's cool. Let's see what else is in his, okay, iron icon. I'm going to need to get. And I know the names of some of these, so I can kind of cheat a little bit on it. All right, there's iron icon. And then I'm going to need to get that SVG set thing, okay? Because that's a dependency down here, and it's a different repo. It may already be there, but just to be safe. Yeah, it was actually, but it was an outdated version. Um, all right, so we've got those dependencies. Person testimonial. Um, I know my little tooling automatically has hacks body behaviors in it, so I'm not going to grab that. Um, and then I'm referencing that other element, and so I've got all the dependencies in place. Woohoo! Download all the dependencies. Okay, so now I've written what this is. I leave a little reference to a demo. Um, the demo I can also open, and we'll see. There's just a person hyphen testimonial to start out. So we're going to leave that open because we're going to use that in a second. Um, that person testimonial icon, I don't really even need to have open anymore. Um, so it's going to power that one icon and we're good to go. So uh, let's come in here, person testimonial. All right, so you can see uh, he's done some colorizing of things, dark slate gray. Um, I tend to try and use... Uh, materialize colors as much as possible, which is more, more a preference thing to be perfectly honest, but um, because we actually leverage materialize CSS's color set, um, which is the same as Google's material, it just they give a class structure to it. Um, and I'm a really big fan of, of this, just as far as knowing that uh, you can cycle between things mathematically pretty easily and know that I can go cyan and then darken hyphen and then do like you know, one, two, three, four, and then make something that cycles it back two steps or forward or go across a band. Uh, it's just really, it applies a nice level of math to, and logic to uh, these color codes, which the color codes are ones that Google has defined basically and said, these are the colors we will use for everything. So instead of working in color codes, you can work in the word yellow. It's just super convenient. Um, so as a result of that, I'm gonna pull in, um, I have materialize, in here, it's built in out of the box, but materialize CSS styles and materialize CSS hyphen styles. Um, in both those cases, if you're not using the stuff that I use for the tooling, you can go to materialize CSS and find materialize CSS styles and do the same step. I basically am just skipping this part, right, where I click the little button or hacks body hyphen behaviors. Which, which should be there it is. And do the same thing, right? I can click and get hacks body behavior. So, um, all right. So we're gonna pull in materialize CSS styles. If I wanna use those styles, right? So if we see what is in materialize CSS styles for a second, uh, I can reference this file and see that it imports something called colors and something called shapes. And then it also supplies some behaviors um, which we might actually use, um, but uh, let's see here. Okay, so it pulls in and includes styles and colors, um, which then means you can leverage leverage the class name. It's kind of like copying those class names in um, as rudimentary as that is, so that then when I go to colors, you see we have this nice little series of all the color names in the stinking universe. Um, ours actually extends upon the materialized CSS colors as well. So we take that and go into border color as well for the primary ones uh, and outline color. These are things not supplied by the materialized CSS uh, spec, but just as a really brief, right? So like color and background color are set. And so we just extend that to do it for uh, outline color order color, and um, and then we have some variants that are accessible text variants. So 
Um, I don't know why you would want an accessible amber text. It's disgusting looking. However, <laughs> these, these values were tested to hit WCAG uh, 2.0 AA uh, to still be in that color family and be on white on a white background. Um, so if you really needed lime, accessible lime text for some reason, you could do that. Uh, I wouldn't recommend it. Um, gray is a, a nice one though, right? So that you don't have a true black for what your text is, stuff like that. So we don't use these a ton, but they're there. And then if you need them for variations, you can use them. So then we can kind of assume, right, from through element stacking, right? So I've got those definitions of CSS, and then we've stacked them into this file. And then because we leverage that file in here, it's like we have all that brought along. Um, this is kind of how we're able to build stuff of a semi-consistent design uh, pretty darn quickly, um, just by building our Lego bricks out the right way. So as a result, I'll have access to those colors and those color codes. Um, I'm not gonna leverage those just yet. We can see Chuck's done some, some good work on, uh, you know, some basic media queries here, right? To make sure that when we hit certain breakpoints, it doesn't look terrible. Um, some simple wrapping. Uh, this is another, another interesting uh, thing to point out, I think. You'll notice uh, he has a lot of pixel definitions. And if you're a CSS purist, you might be looking at this and going, where are the EMs or the REMs? Um, I, I actually moved everything over to Ms and then REMs. And now in this type of a worldview, really pixels make a lot more sense in most cases. Um, because you, you're intentionally scoping these things. These are not you know pure layout elements necessarily. So like in the case of a line height, a lot of times I'll pull up uh, a calculator and do the, do the little math real quick here, 1.5 times 16 and get 24. And then I'll even you know, say, okay, well, that, actually that's supposed to be 24 pixels. Where this really helps is especially because a lot of our endpoints are content management systems or you know, a larger wrapper of a system. And we don't always have control over whether or not we're running in shady DOM or shadow DOM. Um, I like to run in Shady DOM personally, which means there is the possibility for bleed through. Um, and so if you're in that mode, uh, this is forcing this to be 16 pixels as opposed to relative to whatever the heck the page is defined. So anyway, um, you can see Chuck has this cool arrow here, start of a quote and the end of a quote, and he then rotates the quotes, which is a nice little, nice little trick there. Um, and then we get into the actual structure of the elements. So he's leveraging paper card and iron image and then binding something called image to it. Um, and then he's got his, his uh, starting quote and ending quote and a slot tag. Now the slot tag is effectively the same as saying whatever is inside of this element, place it here. So let's go to our demo real quick, show what, that, what I mean. So that means anything I write here in between the tags will not get lost. Um, now it could get lost, however, because I've defined a slot, it'll put it there. Another thing you can do with slots, you can do like name slots. So I could say, oh geez, let's put in, for no reason, <laughs> for right now, let's put in a name slot up here and the name of this slot is uh, prefix. All right, and now I can go into my demo again now if I do this, if I do span uh, slot equals prefix, all this shows up before the rest. And then anything not in a slot or a defined slot is assumed to go into the just generic slot container. Um, so I, I don't have to encapsulate this, but I just like to, generally speaking, encapsulate things. So even if it goes before it, so if I have all these statements here, right? So this is gonna be called statement one. Statement one is gonna flow into that slot and then this one, and then this one. Let's make sure they go in the right order. So statement three or two in the third position. Wow, I can't type on this. The, okay. I say, all right, so let's uh, go to our little demo. So we've been messing with it and haven't actually reloaded. So I reload, you'll see it says person testimonial. We're starting to see our, our properties built out and documented. Um, and now I can hit demo and we're starting to get what sort of looks like an element. Um, but 
this is that illustrating the slots aspect. So there's slot prefix, and because that was a name slot, it's gonna show up here. But those other three, because they're not named, are gonna show up over in this and do it in the right order too, which is pretty cool. Okay, so I don't need those name slots. That was just a detour. Um, I do need content in between here. So I'm just gonna leave uh, some information in there. What we're gonna change this to is, I know hacks. I've used hacks. I've written hacks. And let me tell you, hacks, it's hacks all right. All right, so this is an incredibly deep quote, obviously, by, uh, by one of our, our customers. Um, and so that way, when we have a testimonial from one of our customers, we can get that, that that customer knows hacks. Awesome. Okay, so let's go back to our docs and we'll let, let's update this. So um, you can get this aspect updated, show some additional details here by going into person testimonial. Uh, first, I'm gonna take out that slot prefix. Um, and then I need to go into the properties and doc block. Here. So if I doc block this to comment it, um, and then put it on one line. So what's, what's image? Um, the profile image to display to the left of the quote. All right, so I'm just gonna kind of describe what these things are. Now testimonial, where is testimonial even used? it would appear it's not used. Okay, so I can take that out. My guess is that uh, when Chuck was writing this, I've done this too, he probably had something like this, testimonial. And then he said, oh, you know what? If I make this a slot, it's way more flexible. And so then he did. So let's take out testimonial because we don't need that hanging around. Uh, image, I'm not gonna give image a value of nothing um, or empty string rather. Um, Reflect to attribute is not super critical here, but um, can show what, what the difference is with that in a second. Um, so name, I guarantee name is up there. Yeah, name and position are up here for this uh, with data binding. So name, let's set a default like Joe Hacks user, right? And so that's the name of this. Uh, let's do a Hacks user. Um, instead of Joe or just hacks user. And then uh, position. Uh, so the title slash position of the person in question. Okay, that. And in fact, let's do this. Let's put for position, the default is a hacks user. Uh, position, I don't care about reflecting. We'll go over that in a second. And name someone Nick hacks obviously you have to have a Mick in your name there and so someone MC hacks there we go um, so let's get name out of there and description name of the person making the quote okay position okay so again stickler for spacing um, so now that we've got that in there, let's go hit refresh here and you see we get these little areas documented. So we have a default for that, we have a default for this, we have a string in for image. Um, I'm gonna bring along a, a sample image here um, of me, of course, obviously. Um, person testimonial, in demo, I'm just gonna paste headshot.jpg, woohoo. Um, and then in Sublime, do value, uh, and it's not demo at that point, it's just gonna be headshot.jpg. All right, so the point is not that you would use these defaults, obviously, it's just to illustrate it right here. Uh, a lot of times I'll give defaults to things just so we get a sense of it. Demo, and then, hey, there's me. I know hacks, I've used hacks, I've written hacks, and let me tell you, hacks, it's hacks all right. And someone McHacks, a hacks user, clearly said that. So now you need to buy this product. Um, however, let's start to look at some of the details of uh, Hacksy McHack, Hacks face here. And so you can see person testimonial, this is an interesting 
uh, discussion point here. So person testimonial image equals headshot.jpg. However, in the little example, no image.jpg. Also, you'll notice that these other properties here have not shown up here. That is what is, is happening when you reflect something. Now, I, there's, uh, I've seen mixed things about reflecting values. It's not super critical um, to reflect values. Uh, however, if you want to do theming based on a reflected value, a value, then it's important to reflect values. And what do I mean? So uh, if elevation was data bound, right now elevation is just one. Let's data bound it. So let's do elevation because it's stinking easy to use that twice. Okay. And then let's add a property for uh, visual height of the card. Okay. Elevation. And we're going to say type is number and value it was one before let's make it one and this one we're going to reflect to attribute true because that's actually important this one not really even though we could um, so now when i go back to here refresh i get elevation number default one visual height of the card awesome come here it's still that little one off the interface let's inspect and pull this over Sorry, I didn't actually have that on camera before. So um, there we go, person, person testimonial, elevation one. Now if I make this five, there we go. I could update it in, you know, on the fly. Now I could come into this. Um, I could say image equals uh, nothing and it would screw up my image. So, I mean, you are able to you know, set attributes here and have it turn them into properties, uh, even without the reflect. However, if I wanted to do something visually, whenever the elevation changed, and obviously elevation changes it visually, but if I wanted to say, you know what, uh, host elevation equals five, uh, and then we do something crazy, and the something crazy is like background color blue, I don't know, something like that. Uh, if I don't reflect elevation to attribute, I'm not gonna be able to do that because CSS is using the attributes uh, in order to calculate this. So now that I've said that and I've, I've reflected it, let's go in here, I can do demo and nothing has crazy has happened yet. However, now when I take this and I make it five, it should have done something crazy, but there's probably something in the way of, of the crazy happening. Let's see. Um, Apparently elevation equals five is not correct. Is that, maybe it has to be like that. Not sure, I haven't actually set that one. Uh, sometimes you'd swear I screw up on purpose just because I'm told I don't in these videos enough. So there we go. So there's, you can see it bleeding through as that blue line. And so I had to have a string based evaluation. So if I go up to, paper testimonial, and you'll see now CSS has styled that. Uh, which one I can do color, right? So you could do some stuff like that. Now, in the case of elevation, no, that doesn't make a ton of sense. But uh, if you did something like outset or inset, or maybe if these quotes, you had a flag for the quotes being on, decorated on there, or the arrow, and if those things didn't, didn't show up and they were just booleans, then maybe you changed the distribution of this image a little bit, or maybe if there's no image, Right, things like that that you could do. Uh, so that's what reflecting is. It's a really important principle of building these things out quickly and uh, then being able to style based on the, the, the data-based changes that people make. Um, so, okay, so we've got this element. We've documented a little bit more. I wired in elevation um, behaviors. So this is leveraging the hacks behaviors, properties behaviors which basically just means it's gonna supply functions automatically. So um, before we get too deep into that rabbit hole, because there's a this.set hacks properties and you go, well, I don't see that function here. How the heck does it work? Well, that came from the behavior. So you can go dig into that behavior. But first, I don't like setting defaults needlessly on things, especially for demo content, right? Like I don't want my face to show up all over the internet just because people start using this incorrectly. Um, so. Let's take that headshot JPG. Let's get rid of the value there. And instead, we're gonna just put it on here, like we should for the demo. 
Uh, same with this. I don't want you know, a value to be there, right? Because maybe you don't actually want these things to be used. Oops. Uh, I need to get rid of my quotes or change them. Okay. Change my quotes around. There we go. Someone make hacks. Um, and then we'll get rid of a hacks user for position. Position equals. There we go. Okay. So now I've got those defaults all in there. I am going to leave a default, though, for elevation, because I want elevation to just be one out of the box. But people could set it to whatever they want. Um, so now, refresh, demo, and there we go. Same thing, except now we've filled it out as to how to use it. Another nice thing with the Polymer tool, you can get this little like, copy and paste thing. And so then if someone wants to copy your demo that you're establishing there, then they can paste it in. It makes it a lot easier for them to uh, kind of have the API, if you will, of your element. Because as I add properties, I'm effectively forming an API. All right, so now let's get into that attached lifecycle. Because let's say we want to wire this to hacks, because that's the fun part. So I basically just steal hacks. I mean, I wrote the thing. But I basically just steal hack schema from other places. Um, but let's step through real quick what this does. Um, a lot of times I go and get it either from the hacks body behaviors um, behavior, which if, if I uh, pull up, don't want to glaze over hacks body behaviors. Um, so I have hacks body behaviors here. There's a demo in or example in here. There's a prototype as well as so you can pick through it. It has a ton of documentation associated with this one series of behaviors because it's really making hacks able to be built against very quickly um, through this simple uh, JSON blob. So you can read through the details. I'm not going to go over that right now. Um, effectively, though, when you apply this, you get a hacks properties property attached to whatever your element is. So just by um, using by writing this and saying pull in the behaviors, Polymer is smart enough to take the parts of this element. Think of this like a proto an edge of an element, right? That you want to like graft onto here, and then it grafts it on. So, so that means you get the functions. You get the properties. You get anything else that's supplied here automatically available in kind of the this dot of your element. So that's how this dot set hacks properties exists uh, is, by, is through the behavior. And so what set hacks properties does is it does some validation that what you have just given us it it looks like um, a valid hack schema. And so thing you can see things like scale and if it can edit source and position. Uh, the gizmo steps through the different parts of a form in hacks, like a quick form and a configure and advanced. It adds in some things automatically, which is also kind of nice. You don't have to keep defining them. So it adds in attribute binding for class, style, ID, prefix, type of property, resource. The reason uh, that these four are here as well um, is that uh, part of why we're doing this is so that we can schematize the web really quickly. Uh, and so that's why these always show up in advanced settings. So then we get into some other things. And this is, this is the critical piece. So this is how hacks kind of, this whole thing works. Um, so you put your element on the page, and you put the definition in. And then when the browser goes to tell your element to show up, you have invoked an attached lifecycle, which says, hey, run this last, more or less. Like when the element is all good to go and the DOM is about is showing it, then run this. And so then all the elements that make hacks aware that they can be modified fire a consistent event. And that happens through the hacks body behaviors. And so hacks body behaviors will do a, after it's validated and said, yeah, this, this looks like it's valid hack schema. It'll ensure that hacks is actually on the page because you could use this element without it. So if hacks is on the page, which there's a hack store that's getting into the internals of it, then uh, make sure that we have a list of elements. And if we have a list of elements and we aren't currently defined, uh, then I need you to fire an event that has all this data. So that that is how hacks goes. Oh, I know what a person hyphen testimonial tag is. And I know how to modify it because it told me. And so uh, that's how it runs through. You can also see some like fallback, like, hey, what you sent me doesn't look like hack schema. Um, so there's some settings validation, uh, and there's also something that takes hacks JSON and converts it into JSON schema, which is super useful. Um, 
in general for, for build, you know, if you wanted to build out a headless UI, you're going to need JSON schema to do it. It, it builds the forms for you. Um, and so then in here you see a, a rather advanced uh, configuration for how the heck this works. So let's go to person testimonial. Let's wire this up to hacks, right? So this is the, the fun part, if you will. So I, I, right, our build process, we make this, we do some properties, we put it in place, we have it tested visually, we can publish this to a public demo, uh, which I'll do in a second, and we've communicated to our team, this is the visual asset. Um, now let's get it into our, our content authoring experience. Um, so I'm gonna say that this, uh, yeah, you can scale this, why the heck not? Um, and that it can be positioned, so that's just, right now it's simple floats, but that'll be changed in the future, hopefully. Um, so gizmo definition. All right, this is a testimonial. Um, a person saying a nice thing about us. Uh, we're going to use format quote for that. Sure, orange. Um, this is this stuff is all just like how it shows up in hacks when someone goes to edit it. And so, you know, color really doesn't matter that much in this case. But I'm going to say it's it's orange. Um, and this is a content element, and it's for presentation purposes. We haven't implemented this groups part yet, but I've been. It's kind of think of this as tagging, right? If you wanted to, if you imagine, we're going to get up to a lot of design assets uh, pretty quickly here. So we want some way of being able to filter them as once we hit a certain number. Um, and so then handles is really important when it comes to um, data binding from remote sources. And I'll show this uh, in context in a bit. But basically, um, this is the different ways that the app store specification and hacks knows how to treat this gizmo. Now, you don't need to define Handlers, you could just have an element that can't be handled on the fly. Uh, but I like to wire everything up just in case I end up using it at some point. Um, so uh, we'll go we'll go down through here. We got meta, author, and this is Eberly ODL. Um, we'll say this is by both teams, LR and web components. Um, and so that part doesn't show up anywhere. Some of this starts to be like, you know, we're gonna clearly be making our UI more robust as we go forward. It kind of just built out the schema to, to support that. Um, okay, so now we get into the interface part. So then I need a settings object. You'll see settings object is kind of the rest of this. Then there's three groups of settings. There's quick, configure, and advanced. Um, you don't need to define them. If they're empty, the, the set properties stuff will validate to put it there, but I just like to have them around. So quick, okay, so what we're, the way that we read this is we say property, okay, so bind to up this property in the element. And so in this case, it's image. All right, so when I want someone to be able to edit the image, show the title image, and then give a descriptive text of add image to, the test, to this testimonial, how can they input an image? Well, they can input it as a text field. All right, so that's going to put a text field on the interface. It's going to have the word image on it, and it's going to make the default value uh, two-way data binded to the image property here. Uh, on the bar, I want you to show the icon as insert photo, uh, which this editor thing goes into kind of the depths of the, the iron icons stuff mentioned earlier. Um, then I can do the binding for other things. So I can say property name, full name. I can say position. I can go into, uh, from there, into configuration form for more advanced stuff. So I can say image again. Uh, so this would be like when the hacks has jogged up the interface and we have that modal to work on this thing in a vacuum. Um, and then this is a, an inter a important point here. So I'm going to move this around. I want that to be uh, uh, actually the second thing because it's the second thing you see. So this was a big deal. Like a few weeks ago I got this working. You can actually do property, attribute, or slot binding via this. And so what that means is when you do a slot bind, you are going to effectively be write, rewriting the guts of that element. Um, and so in this case, it's you know where the testimonial is. And so we're going to do users, oops, uh, users, geez, I can't type, testimonial. Okay, so this is the testimonial where you enter your testimonial. Uh, in this case, we're going to use a code editor. I want them to just kind of write whatever they want. Um, 
And you can also put required flags on things. So like an image actually isn't required in this case. Um, if you read the spec, there's some additional like input validation and things. Um, so you can validate that something's a URL or that they entered a number or, or um, there's other types of, of uh, data bind or wiring here. Um, okay, so then let's do, um, let's do something about that color though before we get too far down the hacks road because um, I brought up the materialized color stuff. And so we see here, we've got me. Uh, this is pointing to this quote. Cool. Hacks, the hacks wiring didn't change anything. But, and I know Chuck wanted to, uh, was asking about this the other day. So I wanted to know, how can I make this anything? And so this is a, a unique case for us um, because normally when we mess with colors, we really have to be cognizant of like accessibility um, because you know a lot of times they have text implications. This is a unique color though in my mind because the way this is used, it's literally just an accent to something. Um, to you know, th this isn't going to be communicated via any area text, right? It's it's an image, and then the usual um, a screen reader would say, oh, there's an image, and then there's text. It's also not going to have any implication. Um, you know, for people with color blindness and things, because it's not providing any real value. It's just, hey, this is just a little accent to the thing. It's aesthetically pleasing. Um, so in all that, <laughs> we don't really need to worry about the accessibility of this necessarily. It's a pure aesthetic element. And so it would be cool to let people be able to modify the color. Like, yeah, we said it's orange, but you might be building a site where your business's primary color is blue, or maybe the client who you're quoting, their primary color is purple. You should be able to use their exact color, right? That would be really nice. Like, I mean, we work at Penn State. If it's a quote by someone at Penn State, it would be nice if it was blue and white. Um, so let's dig into how we would go about handling that, because there's a couple different ways. Um, but uh, let's look at the video player as an example of how I handled this. Um, the video player in Hacks, I'm going to call up Hacks real quick so we're on the same page here. So the video player in Hacks has this, and this is one of those little demo points, I, I, things I like to point out in my random walk demos. So I go into Hacks edit mode, I select that, I get my quick menu options with the paint can, and I say uh, I want that to be um, black, and it changes it. Oh, you know what? I want it to be light pink, and it changes it the other way. And then I go, wow, look at that. The text color changed dynamically. Um, so that's what I was referring to with accessibility. Uh, we don't really need to worry about the accessibility aspect of that, but this color switching and data binding is really useful. Uh, so that I could pull this in here and have the same UX pattern that I just had there. I could watch this thing flip between them in real time. It's really useful. All right. So how do we do that color binding? Because we want to add that theoretically into our person testimonial, right? We want a color or a class name, right? I want to say blue and have it know how to make this blue. That would be incredibly useful. So um, if I if I was doing it with like the video player, which is that's what this is, and you know, back to the attribute binding, you can see I have a flag for responsive in there which I then reflect to attribute. And then as a result, I can put in place some of that uh, crazy logic with video containers to make them 16 by nine resolution dynamically. Uh, however, if I look at the class aspect, you can see there's secondary color class. And if I go down to secondary color class, I can see it's not actually defined. So no one is going and typing secondary hyphen color hyphen class equals blue. Um, What's happening is via the hacks binding, it's a computed property. And so it's computed, which means run a function, and then whenever this value changes, you're going to have to reprocess, and then you'll change. And so it's bound to secondary color. And then we can see via the UI, and this is the, the hacks data binding part. Via the UI, I use input method color picker and I've bound it to secondary color. So that's how in the UI, when I click a color, that that color value filters through. But in the video player, the video player has this computed value so that when you click and update the color code, which is then a materialized CSS color, I know it's you know FF2243 or whatever, that then it comes into here and we use this compute color class. And compute color class is a function that I wrote 
that fires uh, and says, hey, if you're pure white or you're pure black, put these two values. Otherwise, let's do this. And so it runs a color transform. So it verifies, hey, this looks like a hex code. And then it runs color transform. Well, color transform doesn't live in here. I'm hitting return to go to the next instance. Um, what is, though, going back to our behaviors concept, is there's behaviors for these types of alterations to color. And you'll see there's actually a lot of sophistication as far as uh, usage of different behaviors in video player. Video player is one of the more complex um, kind of abstracted elements that I've made so far. Um, so let's use those materialized CSS behaviors so that we can do a color transformation. That will be stinking awesome. Um, so let's pull in those color behaviors. And now we have them. That was really hard, right? <laughs> um, no, we, we reference materialize CSS styles. And so then that'll pull in those parts of that element so that we can say blue or what, uh, what have you. Uh, the other thing we're going to want to do is, I didn't do this before. Uh, this is kind of your like using a style sheet in a style sheet thing. So you could reference something that has styles but not actually use them if you really want it. So I'm going to put this here. That effectively says take those colors like the red and the blue and whatever and make sure that they're av available here. Uh, so, you know, so that you can cascade style sheets. Weird. It's almost like there's a, a shorthand name for that. So now uh, we need to set up the property binding part. So let's see how we did that in video player again. I've got color transform. We're going to use this color compute color class function, just lift it completely. Um, I'm going to throw it in here. Actually, I like to put my attached lifecycle there. So I'll do compute color class. I don't have any connotation of uh, the pure, pure black and pure white in this. Um, so let's do compute color class. Just make sure it smells like a hex code and then uh, transform it. And what this color transform function does is um, in materialized CSS styles, it is going to go and it's going to look through this monstrously annoying array I built one day <laughs> and, and look for the hex code, which is the official Google color. And then it's going to deliver the official materialize name for that color. Uh, so you can go either direction. You could say, you know, what uh, I need to know the hex code for blue accent two, or you could say, I need to know what, uh, hex 29B6F6 is, and it would return light hyphen blue, light in one. Um, the reason for this transformation is we're, in this case, leveraging another element, which is color picker. And because the color picker uh, returns color codes, so when I select one of these, an event bubble, uh, a property bubbles up, and the property is like hex, I can then take that hex and convert it into color code to apply the correct class to this area so that video caption then gets amber darken one uh, and that it's this hex, but I don't want to just set that hex because it's not, it's not really sustainable to start setting forcible style hex codes all over the place. But it is to set a class that has very consistent naming structure. So anyway, uh, we've got compute color class. Let's see from video player again where we used compute color class, which was in secondary color class. And we're also going to need to bring along secondary color. Um, and I can rename these, but okay. So secondary color. And then the other aspect of this is I'm going to need to do um, some evaluate a, an attribute evaluation data bind. And so we'll copy some of that. Again, I said I, I work a little weird because of um, the wonderful Alfred. So arrow right is something I'm going to need to hijack in some way, and I may need to actually use some of my goofy um, classes that I made because there's this border. It's actually a border that he's setting instead of a fill. Um, however, the other one, oh, that's Iron Image. He's using a border to the right of it. So we'll see if I can actually, if I can actually set this. Um, what I might need to do is something like border right style. Yeah, let's abstract this a bit. Uh, border right style solid order right, um, not color, but width, there we go, five pixels. And then this will just be border color. 
And so this way they all play nice together. It's an obnoxious abstraction, oh my gosh. Um, and then down in here, you see he has border left for this one. And we're going to then set that to, uh, oh, border, yeah, we'll set these the same, except this is gonna be 15, that's not gonna be left, okay. That should work because this is more specific than this. And so then that will force it to be transparent. Um, another way I could handle that is I could say border hyphen top hyphen color and do transparent that way, uh, which would be a more specific selector than the one that's gonna come in. Okay, so let's do that. All right, so yeah, let's leave them there, it's not a big deal. So, now I've abstracted that a little bit. And the reason I do that is because I'm going to be targeting, I'm gonna be pulling in a class called like red hyphen border. And so I'm gonna need it to be, you know, this color in order to work effectively. So let's go back in to here. And so that is on what the arrow and the image, right? Um, image, yeah, the iron image, okay and it's also being applied to the arrow right. So arrow right is there, and so now we're gonna to need to do that evaluative attribute bind, and what do I mean by that? So in uh, Polymer, when you do data binding, you'll notice here I have uh, elevation equals, and it's just elevation. You can do that because this isn't an actual um, attribute of the browser. Um, and it gets a little confusing because SRC is an attribute of the browser. However, it's iron image is not a real, uh, it, you know, HTML primitive. And so you can do this because this is actually a property. However, an attribute is like the things that are given to, in, you know, imbued with all HTML elements basically, right? So another example would be if I wanted to set like data hyphen cool hyphen stuff, you've seen people do this for years where they want to stuff data here. Um, However, because that's an attribute, it's not a property. The difference being that a property is like a full blown, it has data structure attached to it. It could be an object, you know, as a simple example. Whereas attributes in HTML are basically all just little strings sitting there or booleans. Um, so if I want to set this, Polymer needs to do something special and it does it via this dollar sign convention. Um, so I could do error, oh, arrow color or accent, accent color is the, one I, the word I wanted to use. And so what this says is, hey, ignore what you had there because you're being set you know, by the primitives. I need you to force this to be the value is more or less what that's saying. And so the other nice thing is that'll update dynamically. And so this is how we've been able to kind of, uh, kind of cheat on this with the video, video caption as you see there. Um, so I can do that accent color like that. Um, I need arrow right though, because that was the class, it wasn't video caption. So this should be enough to get me the color to come in and also be the class name that's after arrow right. So it'll, it should, um, you know, if I data bind accent color to like orange, right? It, then if it knows what orange is, it should show up. Um, so the other place I'm gonna need to do this is on the iron image itself, uh, because I believe that's where he has the border. And so I'm going to take out that arrow right part, but I still need to do this bind because class is gonna be basically set by the browser default as an attribute of nothing. It's just gonna be empty unless someone puts something there. Okay, so now I've got accent color accounted for. Now I need to add property for accent color. Um, but we're actually adding two properties, right? So we're adding a secondary color class and then we're adding secondary color. And now I'm gonna change this to accent color, um, except minus those little data binds. We're gonna say this is the accent color. And then we're gonna have accent color class, accent color class, okay. And accent color class is reflected to attribute and it's computed based on accent color. Um, I'm, at, I'm not gonna set an observer here, I don't need that. I'm not gonna reflect it and I don't really need that. Um, I will set it to null just so that there's 
something there instead of undefined out of the box. So, um, although accent color I could, I could, should set to um, whatever he has as this border color. Now the border color he's picked in this case was kind of this orange, right? It's, it's a darker orange, tone orange. Um, I'm going to say that that's amber. It, it's not, but it's pretty close. Um, actually, it's probably closer to orange darkened one. Yeah, it is. Um, so, but I'm going to say it's amber for the purposes of, I know I need to mess with border color. Um, so let's go into border color and accent color. We're going to say by default is amber. Okay. And so then, you know, if you think of this whole thing unpacks, so to speak, I'm going to put this first, just a silliness thing. Um, so you imagine Polymer's going to load up this element. It's going to come through. It's going to sweep in and say accent color, amber, cool. Then it's going to get to accent color class and it's going to say, oh, I got to compute that based on this, which is amber, which means it'll run this function and go, oh, you know what? That's not, that doesn't look like anything I know about, right? <laughs> so the reason that is, is because that's not a real thing. Um, this accent color thing being amber, it expects it to be the hex value. So we need to put the hex value there for our default. Now for any of this stuff to work with this kind of, this is kind of crazy to do this data bind, it has to be in this case material color. Um, you could do this data binding via other methods, but you're gonna need some consistency to be able to go between a hex code and a, a color class. You could bind directly to this, right? Like I could do accent color, and then I could come in here and I could say style E, and this is gonna have to be an attribute bind. And then I could say style, uh, border hyphen color equals this. And I, I honestly may end up having to do that anyway. Um, but we'll see, I wanna try and stick with this, with the material stuff here. Um, another thing that color transform provides, if we look at color transform, oh, I closed the window for it. Um, if we look at color transform here, is part A and part B, get color class, and get color class has part A, and uh, a bunch of people on the team at first were like, why the heck did you do that? Um, well, this way, in the case of amber, right, so amber is down here, and it's that FF11 whatever, right? Um, there it is, actually, okay. So that's amber for this color code. This code would come up, and it's amber, and then part A, and go like, what the heck is part A? Why is there a part A in there? Because there are variations off of the same color. And one of the most obvious ones is text. And so if I pass in hyphen text, it's gonna append hyphen text in the correct place so that I can lighten and darken text as well as backgrounds off of the same style. Uh, so the other reason is I have borders in there. And now I might have to add uh, as a result of this, might have to add support for all those border classes. Ugh, it's gonna be annoying to write. But um, this is how we're gonna get amber hyphen border. And what I'm gonna pass in is hyphen border. Now, it may not work correctly with this, you know, part B darken four stuff. We'll see if that actually does anything meaningful. Um, but I'm going to go into my person testimonial and for part A, I'm gonna do hyphen border, which is gonna append the hyphen border class name to it. I could also take that out and go up into the code here and do accent color hyphen border, and then accent color, and sorry, it's not accent color, accent color class. Accent color class is gonna get rewritten dynamically, and then what this would allow me to do is to be like, well, I need this to be amber. However, here, it's actually influencing amber border. Um, now, I'm gonna do it this way instead of passing it in via that silly other method. Um, just to, because right now we are influencing the border property, I may have to end up actually influencing something else to do this more consistently, but okay. So we've got that in place. So now we're gonna be computing a color. We've got an accent color. It's gonna figure out what class to put there. I'm gonna save. Um, the other thing we're gonna do, close out that. Um, we're going to go back to our demo 
and we're going to make a couple other testimonials here. And so I don't want to put uh, that wrapper on everything, so let's not put it on the next one. Let's do the demo snippet, though. I do like that. Um, so let's do another one down here. Okay. And this one's going to, again, be to me. BTO Pro said this position. Um, I don't even know what, like, crazy person. Yeah, it's definitely me. Um, coffee person. Oh, that's that's much nicer. I, at times, enjoy coffee. Those times are all times. Okay, good. So now let's see if we can uh, modify that color and have it influence. So it's accent color, and this isn't another important thing. I'm going to write accent color. We're going to put in blue. Um, and then we're going to step through and go, okay, say so I wrote accent hyphen color. Why the heck did I do that? Well, if we go in here and we look at accent color, which is what I set, this is a incredibly obnoxious translation between JavaScript and HTML that, that you have to do. Um, the HTML specification says that everything inside of here that's a attribute name, property name, what have you, uh, has to have lower cases. So like this, right? Which means this is also valid. Data hyphen implies that it's, you know, you can set whatever the heck you want and it'll pass it along and provide the data access to it via get attribute. Um, so I'm going to get rid of that, but then when I translate this other thing, right, because it's actually accent camel case, it's like this, JavaScript doesn't allow hyphens, so that's your way of resolving between the just, this is actually this, as silly as that is. Uh, so in HTML, you write it this way, so everything's lowercase. In JavaScript, you camel case, you don't use, don't use that. So let's uh, go back to our person card here. Load it again. Cool. I've got accent color, documentation. Again, now I've got the color behaviors pulled in for that. We can also see that there's a default value on this. Um, and that reminds me, this is in blue, right? So if I'm setting accent color in this case, I'm going to need to find blue, 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 blue. Okay, blue. All right. I'm going to set blue, and we're going to need it to be this. Okay, accent color of that, so it'll pass that test if it's a real thing. Go to demo, and we're getting somewhere. We're not there all the way, but we've got our blue line in here. And if I inspect the thin blue line, I can see that it has done blue hyphen border and border color. Woohoo! Um, yay, so that actually worked, and it overrode that value. Now I can also see it didn't work here. So let's look at why it's not applying there. We can see it put an arrow right and then blue border. However, um, arrow right class name, and this you know get into some funkiness of HTML, a class name like arrow right is a higher order selector than I guess the blue border one coming right after it, which is kind of weird. Um, so let's, first thing, let's see if we can flip these around, if that's enough to fix it. So we're going to take that accent color border. We're going to put it before arrow, right? And let's see if that does it. Also, I'm going to go to demo. Okay. So that still didn't do it. It's still, still there. Um, all right. All right. So let's look at what we could do there. So that's border color. And border color is coming up orange. Now if I put that in, it's kind of fun. All right, so some of this is kind of messing with these values. Figure out like what the heck do you do there. So um, border right color. Hey, we've got that pyramid there. And then this is an important that one's important. So there, now it's blue. The arrow is apparently flipped, though. I screwed up these classes somehow. So let's go in CSS. Isn't it nice, though, in all this to be fighting with CSS uh, at this level? Uh, so here's the other thing, right? Now that I know that that's going to be calculated, I don't need to supply this anymore. It's kind of cool. Um, so let's take that out. I don't 
Uh, well, you know, we won't take that one out just yet. Um, oh, yeah, actually, you know, we will. We will take that one out, and we'll take out that color definition. Um, because I'm fighting with CSS, it's right here. It's right in scope of this thing. And I can look and go, oh, shoot, you know. Clearly, we're applying, we're applying some weird stuff here. You can see there's darkened border, amber for darkened border. So that is one part of the problem. All right, so we fixed there. So that means I selected the wrong, and that's, that was getting at what I was a bit concerned about. Amber is actually this, but I had previously selected this darkened four. Let's do um, deep orange instead, just because that was kind of what it was supposed to be um, as its default here. Now that should look a little bit better. It's going to be perfect yet. There we go. Okay. So I've still got my arrow inverted for whatever reason. I'm not sure what I screwed up with, uh, with Chuck's arrow to flip it the other direction here because um, it's an arrow to the right. Let's get rid of that and that because they're supposed to be transparent. Let's see. No, it's still the arrow is backwards. Um, Hmm. There we go. I'm lazy. And so we put in our transform to force it to go the right direction um, to flip around. Now, that's kind of interesting, too. It does that edge to it. Now, I wonder if we take off the transform. Nope. That's still there. So I, I clearly did something to it um, when going through and trying to apply these things. Um, all right, let's try this. Width, no, oh, it's not width then, it's just 15. Let's see if that helps at all. Nope, so I'm gonna need to take his, uh, take a look at the CSS of his element and reset it to it, that's for sure. Um, GitHub.com ODL. Oh, geez, what, what did you do? Chuck, there we go. CGL, well, there it is. Eberly OD on my bad. Okay, testimonial. All right, and then I can look at testimonial again and see how he formed that little arrow that I promptly screwed up. Um, <laughs> so he had arrow right, which was above the wrap, and arrow right is supposed to like this. I think I changed border right to border left, I'm going to bet. Yep, that's what it was. I screwed that up. Typed right when it should have been left. Okay, so then this is left, and this is left, and now we should be a little bit better off here. Hey, there we go. That at least goes the right direction for one of them. Um, not on the image, though. The image needs to go there. There we go. Okay. So now they're on the right side. Now we need to get this to be the right color, though. Okay. So we've got deep hyphen orange hyphen border, which we'll see does supply a border color. Um, but let's do transparent. You see it goes away. We clearly don't want that. Um, this is where I wonder if we, if we had like a background color to it. If it would be useful, probably not because it's oh well, it's it's a block at least. Um, but if this one was then white, and the border or the bottom was white, ah, there we go. So we can kind of fake it to be that uh, that angle that we're looking for by saying that it's white. Now that would mean we couldn't make this anything but white. However, it would solve this problem that we're having. And so let's do that. I like I like this solution. Okay, so because I wanted to use the background color anyway, <laughs> to be perfectly honest. Um, so iron image. Um, okay, so iron image. We'll have to come up with something for iron image as a way to handle that. Um, because I don't want the border to be the thing dictating it, really. 
um, but we'll solve that in a second here. So, okay, iron image, uh, we probably actually just want like the image class that's on the outside of it. There we go. So the image class, on the outside, I could say that this has a uh, padding right of five pixels. Here we go, we'll do this. Then we can take away the border. And this is why I didn't want to set that border part previously. Um, so if we say that the padding on the right of the image wrapper or the image container is five pixels, we should then be able to set the background color of it appropriately so that then we can take out these borders. And when we take out the borders, we can use all the colors instead of just our silly hyphen border ones. Um, so let's put that first. We'll have our color class and now these are not going to be transparent, they're going to be white. And this is going to be transparent. There we go. All right. So that now, all right, we're most of the way there. So now we've got our appropriate color item and the padding on this image. Um, oh, I just, I'm applying it to the wrong thing. Okay, so this now needs to be up. A level so we're not applying it to the iron image I didn't really want to apply it to iron image anyway we can apply it there um, although if I apply it to the iron image uh, well, well we'll see what what happens here yeah that's what I was okay that's what I was hoping actually you see as I refresh that we get the accent color and then it fills in so now we can have our little quotes with or without our photo there it's kind of cool now let's pull in and we resolve those styling issues, pull in. All right, now we're gonna have to solve, solve this one. So I'm gonna need to do um, a radius, radius, okay. Border radius is not gonna be just on that. It's gonna have to be on dot image, okay. Do dot image, I'm not sure why he broke these out like this, but that's okay. Um, Actually, I need that on both of them so that the image is a circle as well. Okay, so we'll do that. And then this is screen and max width. I'll just put that in here. Refactor a bit. Okay, border radius. Get rid of image. There we go. And now I'm going to get rid of that. I like all my media queries in one, one area. Um, okay. When they're all the same, that is arrow right, max width, let's do that. Okay, now we have all the media queries together. Um, I also, this is just a personal preference thing, I like to put my media queries at the bottom, absolute bottom, so that I assume everything else is default, and then these start to become the way that we fall back. Okay, refresh now. Hey, we're getting somewhere here. Okay, so. Now, that padding that previously was just on the right, I want to be everywhere. Um, and then margin zero. All right, so now if we do padding five, um, <laughs> I'm not sure why the top of it is, is pulling up so far. I need to see what the heck is going on there. Um, oh, that's why. <laughs> there's there's a margin top of 25 pixels on there. All right, I don't want I don't want that on there. Um, we could do a margin top on the image, and that should be okay. To not uh, to not throw that off, and then padding, we're going to do five picks all the way around instead of just on the right. So now, there we go. Now we're getting there. Okay, so now we got a nice little circle there that then converts itself just like before. But now we're bound to bound to that color uh, that's coming across, and that's nice. So now, if I don't set anything, it's that orange. Um, and now, actually, because I want to stick to what their original mock-up was, um, let's go and get an orange that is very similar to the Ever the Everly ODL orange, if you will. Um, if I look at that color, it's E2801. I don't think that's on here, no. E2, or E, or let's do this. E2801, 
two, three, four, five, six. It's got to be one in here somewhere. Eight, six. Okay, an orange. Okay, so yeah, like that orange darkened thing actually is pretty good. Um, so we'll make the default at E65100. Refresh. Now it kind of look. it's kind of the Eberly orange that it was previously. Um, and we can see that here. So this was the original element. Um, all right, so it's got that that orange, and now we've taken it and we've made it a little bit darker, but we've also added, um, we've expanded upon the responsive capabilities that were in there previously, all right, and we've added support for variableizing that color, but doing it in a consistent way. So now let's wire this whole thing up to hacks, and then we'll have a party or something, because this has been a long video. Um, so I'm gonna get that video player again, because I like to steal things from myself all the time. Secondary color is what I did data binding to in hacks. If we go back in time, there we go. So we're going to wire secondary color up to hacks. It's not secondary color in our thing, it's accent color. And so this is gonna give us a color picker and we're going to go in here and we'll put in that. This is going to be accent color. Accent color. Um, okay. Select the color for the edge of the photo. All right. Color picker. And then, because I want that option to be on the main configuration page, I'm going to put that on there. I'm also going to put it right after the uh, image because just kind of the order they go in that would make sense. All right, so now that's all I had to do to wire up uh, data binding to hacks for the accent color. You see how much more work there was involved in converting, uh, you know, getting classes to be the right way. Um, there's really a lot more of an emphasis on making a really solid element that works and functions great by itself. And then hacks should be like the last thing in your mind. Um, is like, oh yeah, and then as long as I got properties or attributes, I'm going to wire it to that. So let's, uh, let's go through and let's get this thing up. Okay, so in its current state. So let's make sure that I didn't do anything cool, didn't break anything. Um, let's go and um, actually, I think Iron Image has like a fade or something, fade property or something. Uh, let's do that too because that's a little bit jarring with the background color change there. Iron image. So iron image has preload. All right. I rendering the image until it's fully loaded. Okay. And fade. Preload and fade. Let's see what those do. Okay. So do preload and fade on that image. Let's see if that changes anything. I think there's one more thing I have to do with it. No. Okay. Well, you it does, but it's really hard to tell. <laughs> um, so let's, uh, if we read the rest of this, it says, hey, you need to, if you define a background color, then it should fade from that. It'll like show that at first and then fade up from there. So this could be a, a use case for that style-based color code thing I mentioned. So let's do uh, attribute binding to data here. And then background color, instead of that, we're going to set it to whatever the accent color is. And now we get this nice fade in. Isn't that cool? So that now as this page loads, or you could scroll down the page, right? You get that nice like, hey, this just showed up. Um, much less jarring, solid, um, you know, uh, standard animation. <laughs> as far as the fade in. Uh, let's see how they look on mobile. Nice, okay, cool. So, and I can move that out to here. Um, and then I can, uh, let's publish this, because it's looking pretty good. Um, so let's go into terminal. I've got person testimonial. We're gonna make, take person testimonial, make a GitHub repo for it. Again, showing the workflow here. New, all right, person testimonial, a uh, test, visual testimonial, 
asset uh, for communicating how awesome someone thinks you are. Okay, so now I have that repo. Um, again, this gets a little bit of the tooling associated with this whole process is it's already set up a git repo to talk to that endpoint because I know where I'm going to save all these. Um, initial commit based on Everly ODL hyphen ODL testimonial git uh, push origin master. All right. So now we have that up there. Next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to do a um, sh update demo dot sh. And this runs a script that we include with all of our repos um, that's going to generate a GitHub pages branch automatically and render that little documentation site out on the web. So I'm going to answer some questions here. Okay. Generally speaking, I use the latest elements. Uh, I have been getting some questions. I don't use the latest for Polymer and for the web component JS polyfill because uh, I just haven't gotten around to, to moving there. I'm actually not planning on moving beyond those two until Polymer 3 is released. So like later, late 2018 probably, I'll start moving. All right, um, next I'm going to tag, get tag. Uh, we'll say this is... Here, well, I'll do one, sure. Chuck has used this, it's a pretty cool element. Push origin 1.0.0. Okay, and so now we've got a tagged release. Let's see, hey, there's code up here, and we have a GitHub pages branch. Um, I'm going to go to the hacks demo because then I copy that over and I do person testimonial. And we can see that now out on the web is my little demo page that functions exactly like what we showed in this video the whole time for anyone to use. And then what I'll do is I'll copy that, edit, throw it in there, save. Okay. And then uh, as a bonus point step, I'll go to webcomponents.org. I'll do publish element. Scroll down. I'm not a robot publish and now you can search webcomponents.org for person testimonial you can get this little demo go to it see what our documentation is see me with my fade in see all the things that are dependencies of this get our boilerplate language here view it on github star it all that fun stuff uh, and then you can include it in yours so now the reason i publish this here is let's pull this into hacks because that was the whole point of doing all that hacks wine, uh, binding earlier in the video. So let's do LR Web Components, hacks hyphen body. I'm going to paste in that, which is person testimonial. Okay, it's going to ask what one I want for. All right, so now person testimonial is in there. Now I'm going to go into hacks body and the demo for it which is right here. I think this is the right one. I have so many copies of things now. Yeah, it is. Okay. Um, and then I'm going to leverage the fact that I have a little helper cheating element for the demo. Or I can just paste in an element here. I'm going to say person hyphen testimonial. All right. And now I have my person testimonial tag. So what is going to happen? hopefully, <laughs> I haven't tested this at a time, I've just done it a bunch, um, is, all right, so I have my hacks demo running locally via Polymer serve. I'm going to hit refresh. What's going to happen is the page is booting up, it registers these custom elements, escalates them, but when they touch the DOM, which I added it into that little section there, so if I look at, whoops, the body, and scroll down, you can see hacks, apps, we should be able to see the auto loader, which is in there as well. I'm not seeing auto loader at the moment. Um, no, that's math jacks. Ah, there, okay. 
it's, it's there we go. Okay, so autoloader and the elements in the autoloader. Right, so that's all the elements that I place in there. What the autoloader is going to do is go and load the reference for this person testimonial. And you'll see that these show up now. They weren't there when I put in just normal person testimony, which means it escalated and it started to unpack, and then it, which means it's attached to the DOM, which means the event fires and informs hacks, hey, I, uh, you can use this. So now when I hit edit, I go to rich media, make gizmo. There's our testimonial. It's orange. It's got a quote. I can select testimonial. I can start typing and it's data bound. Um, color, oh yeah, that is pretty stinking cool. Uh, I can just swap that all over the place. BTO Pro, right? All these things are just going to be data bound. The person in this video. Um, and then, you know, as far as to an image asset, um, I can point that to anything now. It could be, you know, my own personal image or, or whatever I wanted that it would load. Um, but let's do, let's take that testimonial and start typing insert. And now we have that in the DOM. I can scale it, move it around. I can scale in the window and it will respond responsively at some level. Uh, let's move that up above our other quote, which now looks terrible by comparison. I mean, this block quote, way better. You can see it doesn't respond to those events, but it does respond to that stuff. Okay. I can take the, uh, the image needs data bound and change the name to stuff. Okay. I can click my little thing and I work here. All right. And then I can do the color accent and say, actually, I want that to be orange. I can go into settings and see those reflected. I can duplicate this little thing if I needed to. Apparently, I need it to uh, actually duplicate with what it's changed to, not what it was. That's important to note that it still has the definition of the previous element there. Um, whoops, I don't want to delete it. Duplicate. Oh, there we go. Okay. Delete that one. All right. Um, so now that we're at this point, this is awesome, but ah, that image, I don't want to think. I don't like thinking. So if I go to Rich Media now, let's find something. I got tons of places that have images, right? There's got to be an astronaut like uh, John Glenn. Hey, there's a cool John Glenn. I want John Glenn to show up in the testimonial. Up oh, there's John Glenn. There he is. This guy from someplace. Cool. Insert. And now John is looking, John's looking fantastic. Um, big fan of 60s or 50s or whatever, 40s John, that this is in the, in the suit. Um, so how did that part work, you're saying? <laughs> um, so that part worked um, because of this right here, this handles aspect. And the handles aspect says uh, when you select that source from NASA, uh, NASA, when you click it, it says, hey, this is an image. And, and then it says, hey, hacks, can anyone handle images? And then this thing says, I can handle images. And it says, okay, cool. Um, all right, well, if, but when I handle them, if you have something called source, stuff it in my image field. And we're, we're good to go at that point. Now, we could do additional wiring. Um, uh, some of them have a lot more things to find, and it's, it's a, a lazy key, if you will. It's not, there's nothing hard and fast in the API about it. But uh, you can see I just use some common ones that I would find off of APIs, things like title, caption, citation, description, stuff like that. Um, so let's do some additional wiring to this person testimonial as a result of this. So um, let's copy these because these other fields could possibly come over. In a, in a call and then, you know, so something's going to have a, a title. Well, why don't I put that as the person's name? Um, and something's going to have a caption and we'll just say that that is um, their position and something has a citation or description. Um, and we're going to put that in the, uh, actually I can't do, I don't believe I can do slot binds directly from this. I haven't tried that. So, 
let's just do these two for the time being. Um, so name and position we could auto-populate um, and source being image in this case. So save this and then again it's getting into workflow I'm going to go over to our uh, person testimonial get status see I made a change get add a get commit m um, added more handler fields get push origin master all right and then to pull that via bower into the other side I'm going to get tag when do this like this get push tags and now we have 1.0.1 .1, which has that incredibly small enhancement and then we're going to go over to hacks body again and we're going to do bower install and get that person testimonial um, again I cheated on keyboards um, I have oh my zush running for command line which means I can just kind of push up and it'll autocomplete previously stated things so now I'm going to reload the page, and yes, it does ask if you want to leave the page while you're in edit mode, yay. And we're going to do rich media, and we're going to go to NASA again, and let's do Sally Ride. I think that's how you spell her name. Uh, maybe. All right, so we need a picture of a person. There we go. Well, that's a good picture of a person testimonial shows up and now those other fields populated now are they always going to make sense mm, you know not always obviously um, but it's pretty cool to be able to pull those across and then I have a simple copy and paste to say you know who this is um, and so this is the director all right and she her position and title is Sally Ride Women in Science panel um, from a program titled this. So I could have a quote from her or just, you know, pointing to her in this case. Maybe I don't want it to be orange. It could be green. And again, this, you know, goes back to that accessibility thing. Um, this isn't a huge deal to have this be a different color, right? I mean, it's annoying. You might make something look not great or you can make it white and it goes away. Um, but it's not a deal breaker, right? Uh, so I probably just want something nice and bright to point to. Let's do, there we go a nice green insert and now I've got her testimonial in the page um, so this uh, we're at about an hour and a half runtime um, this is this is our process I mean it just this is the way that I make things um, and it's kind of cool to mess with this one especially like Chuck has done a cool job of accounting for the different ways that this would stack um, so this is, yeah, this is the way that we build assets out. Um, and if I wasn't talking through it, I build it even faster, um, which is a testament to just the approach at which we're going about doing these things. Like, yes, there is still work to be done for sure, uh, but you can build things that are stupidly impressive with hacks in a very small amount of time. So uh, I think the next video I'm going to do is I'm going to take this, and, and if you're in a content management system land, um, maybe you want that to be dynamically generated. Maybe it's not off of some back end. Uh, you know, it's not NASA that's pulling this together, and it's not any of these other sources. Maybe you have a content management system that you want to be able to throw together all kind of testimonials from your users really quick. Um, well, we can do that then. We can go to the moon. All right, so in the next video, um, I think we're gonna go through how to, you know, if we had this data stored somewhere, that we could dynamically generate it um, and, and insert it that way. Uh, so more in the context of a, a CMS instead of some of these more silly examples of, you know, like funny pictures of Jonah Hill and, and stuff.